Okay, Peter, let's talk a little bit about you. How did you first get into jazz in the war years? Well, in 1942, I played my first gig on piano. And during World War II, most of the musicians were already in the armed forces. And being too young for that, I decided to play music. No, but I loved music anyway. I, was a viol I started on violin and then switched to piano and eventually was working six nights a week, um, much to my father's dismay because I was earning more money than he was. <laughs> so that would cause some family ructions. Anyway, at first I didn't realize it as jazz. It was just music that was swinging. And then gradually I began to hear more. Most of what we heard in those days was the swing era. Uh, the Tommy Dorsey band, uh, Benny Goodman, Marty Shaw, and so forth. Um, but it wasn't until just after the war uh, there was a program, the American Forces Network in Munich, and they played wonderful jazz programs, and that's when I really started to get into it. Well, then um, uh, we heard some records, uh, a record by Charlie Parker. This was 1947, maybe. Now's the time and Billy's Bounce. And they were just on 78s, because that's all was available then. And that was fascinating. and. It was intriguing because it sounded great and yet we couldn't really understand it, which sounds incredible today, but it was such new music. And about the same time, I heard some trio records with Lenny Tristano. So then, from then onwards, the influences were the, the bebop, the new music that was coming in, and I kind of sidelined the other, the earlier swing era music. So who taught you the bass then, Peter? Well, I'd had lessons with uh, a studio bass player in London, a wonderful guy, Tim Bell. And he, in turn, had, st had studied with James Merritt Sr., who was known as Old Jim. And after I'd taken some lessons with Tim, he said, why don't you take lessons with Old Jim, because he can take you further. Now, James Merritt Sr., Old Jim, had been a cellist. And as a cellist, you use all four fingers. And what old Jim said, yeah, go back to the standard bass fingering in the positions close to the, uh, the nut because it's too big a stretch. But when you get farther up the bass, the positions are close enough together that you can use each finger as a semitone. And so that's what he taught me. And it gave me a a facility which uh, has helped me enormously. And then when I studied with Lenny, Lenny with his concept helped me to develop uh, that even further. Now, strange as it was, uh, Jim's, old Jim's son, also James Merritt, he taught Dave Holland. And I believe Dave Holland uses the same basic method, in other words, using all four fingers higher up the neck. We well then, I worked professionally in London for a number of years. 1949, I did like a lot of the English jazz musicians did, I took a job on the transatlantic liners. In this case, it was on the Queen Mary, the old Queen Mary. Because that was the only opportunity we could take to actually hear the music live. Mm -hmm. Was that as a piano player? No, no, I was already on bass by then. I'd been on bass since about or 47, around that time. That's, then I, I switched to bass during the latter part of the war years, and, and I got fascinated with that, and that became my main instrument. And what about this, this bass of yours? Tell us about that. Whilst I was working as a bass player on the Queen Mary, one of the stewards came up to me and said, oh, my father was a bass player, and he no longer plays. Do you want to buy a bass, you see? And I said, well, yeah, fine. And it was down in Southampton. Now, that city had been bombed extensively during the war. And when I went to look at it, it had been in a house that was damaged by blast. And actually, I bought a sack of wood. <laughs> Didn't really know what I got, except I knew by the look of it, it was a great instrument. So I brought it back to London. And uh, 
wrapped up basically in a sack and had it rebuilt. And I took it over to my friends, Tim Bell, and we tried it out and it was very quiet. And uh, so we thought, oh, it'll, at least it'll be a practice base, you see. And I thought I bought a lemon, except I knew it was very old, you see. Well, within a few minutes, Tim said to me, does it sound louder to you? And I said, yes. And you, gradually the sound came back. And then when we researched it, it turned out by Hieronymus Amati about 1593, made in Cremona. So it is extremely rare. And although I've had other bases, I've never parted with this one. And um, people say, aren't you afraid? And all that. I said, no, no, it's just, that's part of me. And I think it always will be. I'm sure it will be. You know. Well then, uh, coming to New York, and I arrived in New York a few days after my 21st birthday. And that was in 1949. And there were all these jazz clubs on 52nd Street, which was amazing. The thing about it is we didn't really realize that that era was coming to an end. New York was, for us, was 52nd Street. I heard uh, Charlie Parker, I heard Miles, Charlie Parker had a band with Max Roach and Tommy Potter, Bud Powell on piano, uh, another club down there, that was at the Three Deuces, another club down the road called the Orchid Room had Lenny Tristano's six sextet with Lee Konitz and Warren Marsh, Billy Bauer on guitar, Arnold Fishkin and Jeff Morton on drums, and that was an, an entirely new sound to us. And it was so intriguing that after, I think, the second trip, I and some other musicians started to take lessons with Lenny. I was a little bit hesitant because Lenny not being a bass player, I thought, and couldn't see what I was doing, you know, I thought, well, but I mean, he really clued me in and how to get into this music and how to develop your own voice, develop your own sound, and also develop a conception of how to put the music together. Well then, uh, I'd been working on the boats maybe about nine months, and one time I got into New York again and went to take my regular bi-weekly lesson because we'd take a lesson every time the boat docked. And then he said to me, sort of off the cuff, well, what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, I'm coming to hear you at Birdland, you see. And then he said to me, could you play the first set for me because uh, Arnold has got a, a studio gig wouldn't be? and I was over the moon <laughs> and that's really what as soon as that happened I thought New York's got to be my home so I uh, got a visa by early 1951 which is now about what 54 years ago I came to New York as an immigrant I did it the legitimate way. Uh, New York was my home and I never thought I would ever leave. And I was there for over 10 years at that time. And I had the good fortune, it was, a, it was the peak of the jazz experience. I had the good fortune of playing in, in gigs with Miles, uh, with uh, George Wallington, with Max Roach, with Lee Konitz, uh, later on with Buddy Rich accompanying Billie Holiday in concert, working with Roy Eldridge and uh, uh, Tommy Flanagan and Coleman Hawkins, and so many more of the guys that a lot of them are not around anymore, but those memories will be me, with me forever. And it's, and it's the strength of that music and playing with those guys that brought me from uh, what was originally just a, a, a dance band player into a real jazz player. It was that wonderful period in New York. Then, 19, the end of 1961, I'd gotten ill. I'd been burning the candle both ends. And, idea. and I got ill. So then uh, I came back to Europe for a while and then went to, out to California. And that was another new experience. Lived in Big Sur for three years. Uh, met a lot of wonderful people there. Did some wonderful gigs. And during, that was during the time when I got invited to do a solo jazz concert, first on the radio and then uh, University of California. And it was wonderful. 
a movie called The Sandpiper. It was my only debut in Hollywood movies, and we had to play on that. And that's when I re-met John Mandel, who wrote that wonderful tune, Shadow You Smile. And then, uh, finally, by 1966, by then I was married with two children, and my wife, who was a New Yorker, loved Europe. So we decided to come back, and because I'd already had the connections, we stayed in, uh, in Britain. And I'd been there on and off ever since. But I was soon kicking my heels and missing the jazz scene. Uh, but the jazz scene in England was, uh, there was quite a lot of work, but it, it, didn't, it didn't resonate the same as the New York jazz. So I started to teach uh, school, the Leeds Music School. I, I founded that with an, another colleague, another bass player, Bernard Cash. And we started that off, and then I taught sometimes in London for the Jazz Centre Society. In the meantime, I recreated a studio because one thing I'd forgotten to mention was that when I was in New York, I, I got myself a state-of-the-art uh, recording studio. Did a lot of really famous albums, uh, Booker Little, uh, I did um, Zoot Sims and Alcone, and you know, maybe a whole string of albums with different uh, well-known jazz musicians, and also created a tape library of my own. So then, getting back to the UK, I started again with recording, and then uh, uh, started a label called Wave, which uh, has still survived even today with some close shaves at it being closed down. But anyway, we're still alive, and now we produce CDs. We produce this CD together with Rufus. And now you hear what it was like to do it, you know, but that's another part of the, the wave uh, the wave thing. 1984, I moved my studios into the centre of London, to Hoxton Square, which is now an arts area in London, but at that time it was derelict, and uh, people said, you're crazy moving there, but it worked. We opened studios, we ran day and night to state-of-the-art studios, and then we opened the club, the Bass Clef, which ran for 10 years. And that was the most hectic time of my entire life. I reckon on average I got four hours sleep a night for 10 years, so to give you some idea of what it was like. But it was jumping, and we had all kinds of guys over, and that's when Rufus and I met and started to play together. Uh, Kenny Barron came over, Duke Jordan, Loads of American musicians, some of whom we recorded, and one of the CDs we put out with Kenny, which is just a marvelous thing, just some of Kenny's greatest improvisation on that. So basically I've ran for 10 years. The last two or three years, we'd opened a second venue called Tenerclef. And then uh, they say, uh, in England anyway, they say if you want to make money in jazz, uh, if you want to make a million in jazz, you start with two million. Well, that's what I did, but it was borrowed money. So 1994, I lost it. <laughs> so there's my history till then. Uh, I'm a painter. I started, uh, I was working, going back a few years, 1957, I was working with Buddy Rich down in Florida. And as we can safely say now, Buddy was not the easiest guy to play with, although he was a great drummer. So to, uh, get away from all that tension, I bought myself some pastels and some oils, and I went out in the Everglades and started painting. And my influence mainly had been the Impressionists, uh, particularly Van Gogh, and uh, I've, I've never stopped, except for the 10 years when I ran the club, and there was no time to paint then, except to give the walls another coat of emulsion. <laughs> And what, what about your books, Peter? Because you've been ah, moving out on this, books yeah. since the 60s, yeah, I, mean, I understand. In, you can cram a lot in se into 77 years if you don't sleep much. <laughs> so another thing I've been involved in and for many years has been writing. And I don't mean music, but just, you know, as an author. And I've completed a book essentially about Lenny Tristano. It's his legacy to music, the influence he had in those days in the late 40s and early 1950s. And that's due to be the publishing date, the release date is uh, September this year. And that's with an English publisher. And as, of, as we understand now, there's an American publisher who wants to take it on as well. 
Then the second book is a book about the club bass club, which is again how to make a million out of jazz. And a third book, which is a whole different story, which is about, uh, it's semi-autobiographical, but it's about the cosmos, the energy of the cosmos, and I'm not talking about atom bombs, I'm talking about the real energy, the kind of energy that makes us play music, the energy of life. So that's another book which is hopefully about halfway there now, to be continued. <laughs>